thank you so much to the Campbell Collaboration for inviting me to present this review and to present this work. Um, it's a project that uh, took a while to complete and it's something that we're very proud of, so I hope I can convey it clearly to you all today. My name is Sarah Carthy. I am a counterterrorism researcher and at the time of this work I was based in the School of Psychology at MUI Galway. At the moment I'm working in Leiden University in the Netherlands. This review um, really sought to um, fill an evidence gap, a broader evidence gap, where we were really looking at the potential for a preventative intervention in counter-terrorism, in counter-radicalisation in fact, and this intervention was called a counter-narrative. So we were seeing that there was a lot of talk of this tool to stop people becoming radicalised, but there really wasn't that much synthesis of the effectiveness of the tool um, in experimental settings. So that's really what we were trying to do to bring together this, this evidence base. Before I get into the, the nitty gritty, I suppose, of, of how the intervention worked and, and, and what we found, I'd really like to bring you back to a, um, an earlier concept or an important concept when we're talking about this intervention. And this concept is called a narrative. Um, so a narrative can be understood to us as a story um, most of us are familiar with the beginning, middle and end of a story. You have your protagonist, you have your antagonist, you have a, a point of conflict in a story and then sometimes, hopefully, you'll find that there's some sort of resolution at the end. Um, now this might seem very common sense to most of us and it is. And the reason for that is because as human beings, we're predisposed to um, not only describe but also to understand our lives in narrative format. It's very much how we communicate and this means that narratives in our world are very are very common, they're very popular um, but it also means that they're very powerful and the reason that they're very powerful is because when we communicate in this way the messages that we try to convey automatically become more persuasive and I'll explain why. Ultimately if I'm telling you a story the structure I use when I'm telling it in narrative format, it leads you to believe that the way I describe the characters, the way I describe events and the inclusion or exclusion of certain events, you interpret that as the order of events. It seems as though there's just one singular version of the story. That's what the narrative allows you to think. Um, narratives don't tend to be very complex. And for this reason, they're really conducive to a, a black or white dichotomous way of thinking. Um, like I said, there tends to be a singular version of, of each story. If a narrative is, is told well, if it's a good one, there won't be loads of co competing narrators or, or competing stories with, within the story. Um, and then finally, a good narrative at the end of it, you'll have this resolution where you have some sort of a take home message. Um, like an eye for an eye or, or something like that and that leads you to believe that everything that you've heard before this point makes sense um, and this isn't just something that we see in terrorism we see it for example in health promotion this lady is not telling you to quit smoking but what she is doing is she's telling you her story of smoking and the effect it had on her health and then you're left to ponder what, what maybe you should do and that ultimately makes it quite a persuasive message in advertising as well, we see narratives the whole time. This girl is not telling you to drink this skinny tea, which is a thing. <laughs> um, but what she's telling you is that she drank this tea for 28 days and, and she looks like that. And that, that's going to be quite a persuasive message for somebody, especially if you're quite impressionable. And then finally, um, where we really see a lot, a lot on narratives is in terrorism, and particularly in propaganda. The Turner Diaries, for example, is a story about... A regular Joe Soap, this guy called Earl Turner, is going about his life. He's quite naive to the way the world works. And suddenly he, he has this awakening. He starts to learn that the government, the federal government, is, is out to get him. And there is, there's a conspiracy and he needs to rise up and he needs to defend um, his, um, his right to have a gun, his, his people and all that kind of thing. Um, and ultimately this book, what it does is it justifies terrorist violence. But you don't think that that's what's happening, you're just reading a story. Um, but because of the mechanics of narrative persuasion, this is a really effective way of radicalising people. So this is the setting where we were trying to 
to synthesize the evidence on ways to stop radicalization. We know how people become radicalized, but what happens if we try to counter these narratives, these terrorist narratives? So this is where the review was trying to go. The objective of the review was to provide a synthesis of the effectiveness of counter narratives. So if we have these narratives that are encouraging people to dehumanize members of an outgroup, to think that the government is conspiratorial, to, to have all these thoughts that can lead to terrorism, how effective is an attempt to counter it? If we introduce something before an individual gets exposed to a terrorist narrative, is it going to reduce the likelihood of violent radicalization into terrorism? And we were looking at the effects of these sorts of interventions on primary outcomes, so violent radicalization, and or risk factors for violent radicalization. And we'll talk about them in a second. So overall, um, a huge challenge with this review was to really conceptualize what we were trying to find. What is a counter narrative? So what we said was we considered that any strategy and um, policy or intervention in which implemented techniques to counter an, exist an existing or dominant narrative. There had to be something it was countering with the intention of reducing propensity towards violent extremism. If a study didn't show evidence of a dominant narrative, so something to be countered, we didn't include it in the review. Um, and if the study didn't measure outcomes related to violent extremism, so violent radicalization related outcomes, we didn't include it. So unfortunately, there was a lot of studies that did test the effects of counter narratives, but they measured things like comments, bounce and exit ra rates, likes, shares, these sorts of things. And these aren't actually empirically supported outcomes related to to radicalization or violent extremism. So they would have been excluded. Um, the review took place over two time points. So there was actually two searches. The first search took place in 2015. And to be honest, we were a little bit disappointed by it because there was only eight studies, which is you know to be expected, I suppose, in, in terrorism. It's, it's, a, it's a new emerging area, um, but it wasn't really enough to, to, to really synthesize effect sizes or do the kind of meta-analysis that we wanted to do. Um, so we're disappointed by that, but luckily um, it took us a while to get further than that point and we were able to add a new time point in 2018. Um, and at this point, so it's only about three years later, um, we almost got the same amount of studies. So altogether we got 15 rather than what would have been eight. And this was 19 studies in 15 papers um, and it included 11 randomised control trials and eight non-randomised. So pretty good considering it's um, such a novel area of research. Um, so what did these studies look like? Um, the biggest thing that we were careful to do was to really identify what was the dominant narrative um, in the sample. So like I said, we wanted to be countering something. Um, and the most common dominant narratives we found were hostility towards an outgroup. So this could be in the context of conflict, so for example, Israel and Palestine. Um, towards African Americans, a lot of the US studies were challenging these sorts of negative attitudes. Um, towards Muslims, this false belief that Muslims are um, dangerous or that Muslims are terrorists. Um, challenging hostility towards the government, believing that the federal government is planning some sort of a police state or is planning to um, undermine the rights of the people. Um, and also hostility towards other ethnic groups. So these were the most common dominant narratives. And we found that most of the studies were conducted in a university setting. Um, so kind of bringing kids or, or students into a laboratory and, and doing the study there. Um, some were conducted in schools and some were just conducted in a sort of a local village sort of area. The majority of the studies were conducted in, in North America. And all of them were published in, in peer review journals, varying impact factors. And like I said, the majority of studies were published after 2015. So pretty much after we did our first search, everyone started publishing their, uh, their counter narrative studies. Um, so in terms of what the counter narratives looked like, this was really interesting because um, there was quite a spread of techniques used. The most common techniques were definitely counter-stereotypical exemplars. So, okay, I have a sample of people and they have really 
hostile attitudes towards African Americans. They think African Americans are lazy, they think that they're aggressive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show these people videos of African Americans being the opposite of lazy and aggressive. So that was the most common technique. We also found that some studies decided to use persuasion. So what they did was rather than try to offer arguments against the 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 arguments in the in the dominant narratives, they tried to persuade the sample to not believe what they believed. Um, we also found some studies used inoculation, really cool upcoming uh, technique where it's almost like uh, the way uh, you would inoculate a person against a virus. So you, um, for a in a vaccine, for example, you introduce a dead form of the virus and then the body creates the antibodies to, to deal with the actual virus if, if they ever come into contact with it. That's the premise of a vaccine and you're inoc inoculated. Um, in terms of persuasion, inoculation works in the same way. What they do is they introduce a weaker form of an argument. You create the counter arguments against this argument. And then when you're confronted with a fully fledged dominant terrorist narrative full of all these arguments, you've already um, built up a few counter arguments and hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to deal with it yourself. So it's a really interesting concept. Um, and we found that some, some of the studies use that and other studies use an alternative account. There was a mix of outcomes that uh, the studies measured. Very few measured actual primary outcomes related to radicalization, but there was lots of secondary outcomes like the perception of threat, realistic threat, symbolic threat, and also in-group favoritism, out-group hostility. So these are, are all risk factors for, for radicalization. So luckily we were able to do um, a number of meta-analyses to try and see when we pool all these studies together, what do we really find? And what we found is that overall, when we pooled all the results for the randomised studies, the counter-narrative did appear to have a small effect. So see, it did seem to be working in reducing these outcomes. However, what we also found was that it didn't work the same on all outcomes in the same direction. So for example in perceived group threat um, we found that yeah the, the intervention was effective on realistic threat. The participants didn't actually feel like they were in danger against the outgroup depicted in the, the dominant narrative but symbolic threat, this perception that the other group has different values and norms to you, that wasn't effective and it actually went in the other direction. Um, an outgroup hostility, we found that there was a, a small effect, but similarly, not only was there a difference between um, outcomes or, or sub-outcomes, there was also a different between, difference between techniques. So whilst we found that certain techniques, such as counter-stereotypical exemplars, they were found to be effective, other ones, such as um, persuasion, um, were found to, to cause boomerang effects and resistant effects where the participants were actually more likely um, to score highly on outcomes related to radicalization if they were persuaded not to do this. So this is the typical boomerang effect. So the results were somewhat unpredictable. Um, like I said, on measures of outgroup hostility, there was potential for counter-narratives to reduce susceptibility. Um, on measures of perceived group threat, the effects were somewhat mixed. It worked for realistic, it didn't work for um, symbolic. Um, and persuasive techniques such as self-persuasion, transportation, identification, these were all not found to be effective, likely because they, they um, encouraged the participants to have these resistant boomerang effects. Um, so that's what we found. The best techniques and the most promising we saw were really the inoculation. So this viral, um, this almost like trying to, to tackle a virus, the virus of, of dominant narratives, by um, empowering the individuals to counter them, the dominant narratives themselves, we really found that this was probably the most effective way, um, or most effective technique to embed into, in, into a counter narrative. So overall, there was a lot of different findings. There was a lot of surprises as well, but I suppose what we found was that this is an area that could be synthesized. Um, and this was an intervention that showed an awful lot of promise. Obviously, like most of these things, it would be better if we had more studies um, and that will show us um, show us more clearly what, what these patterns are. Um, but ultimately, it's a promising technique. And with the emergence of new findings, everything uh, should become clearer. <laughs> um, thank you so much for listening. Um, again, 
Um, I hope it's not too creepy just hearing my voice, um, but hopefully you found it interesting and, um, and thanks again.